I'm sorry, I'm going to start. It's 10 or 4? Yeah. Okay, welcome. Uh, good morning and welcome to our Accelerator Discovery Distinguished Form yes. Series. Uh, today I'm very happy to, uh, we're very happy to have Roberto Manduki from UC Santa Cruz. Roberto is Professor of Computer Engineer, Engineering um, at UCSC. Uh, uh, he's an expert in computer vision and he's going to talk about computer vision today. Um, he um, has a PhD in electrical engineer from the University of Padova in Italy. He's from Italy. Um, and he used to work, uh, before going to Santa Cruz, he used to work at uh, JPL and Apple. Um, and this was in 2001, before 2001. Um, uh, he's in the, um, uh, he's invited, um, sitting member of the study section on uh, um, neuroscience vision and low vision at NIH and is consultant of um, Aquify, am I saying it correctly? Mm -hmm. Aquify, um, and uh, on the scientific board of uh, IRA Incorporated. Um, he has been awarded many prizes, I'm just mentioning one in 2000, 2013. Um, he got the uh, Helmholtz uh, Test of Time Award from the International Conference on Computer Vision together with Carlo Tomasi. Uh, so today he's going to talk about uh, designing assistive technology. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Little correction: I have not been awarded many prizes. Yeah. The prize that I got awarded. You are too. But I wanted to <laughs> mention that. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Simone, for inviting me. Here is, it's a pleasure. Of course, we are almost neighbors, so it's very nice for me to cross the hill and come here and see beautiful hills. Did you guys know that when they dis were deciding the location for for UC Santa Cruz, I think that Alma there was a candidate. And then I think they asked the students and they said, we want to serve, so they <laughs> the camp was in Santa Cruz. But of course, it's great to be here. And uh, another correction, I'm not going to really talk much about computer vision. I will mention some. Uh, but but what, I am, what I'm talking about today is um, assistive technology uh, for people with vision impairment. <clears throat> And like the title hints, it's going to be a little bit of a personal experience and the, the, the path that I'm through. Um, I'm going to tell you something about uh, the, the few success and the many uh, problems that I had in this, in this um, path towards trying to build something that can be usable to somebody. OK, so let's see if the system works. So, because this is personal, let me tell you a little bit where I come from, um, besides coming from Italy. And I was said already. Before joining Santa Cruz in 2001, I used to work at a Jeff Apusha laboratory, which is a great place to be, and enjoy it very much. And these were the types of projects that I worked on. These are a little bit old. Every time I show these, I feel older, because technology <laughs> progresses. And, um, but yeah, these were projects related to autonomous navigation. Um, and these were before the DARPA Grand Challenge, for those of you who have heard about that, I think that was in 2004, maybe. Um, so these are three types of, of autonomous vehicles. You probably can tell from the color of these vehicles who was putting the money for this. <laughs> um, and what is a common characteristic here, what, what we were working on, the fact that there were a lot of sensors, all sorts of sensors. We had cameras, stereo cameras, infrared cameras, uh, laser rangefinders, um, um, ultrasound, all sorts of things. And these sensors are important, of course, for vehicles to understand where they are, to avoid obstacles. Uh, nowadays, of course, you have the Google car, which still relies on a lot of sensors and a lot of prior knowledge. So when I moved to Santa Cruz, I had a little bit more freedom about the projects that I could choose. Um, and I thought, you know, OK, this is great. We learned a lot from these sensors and from this technology, can we export this knowledge to something that can have some more direct social relevance? And I've always been sensitive to the issues of disability. So we thought, hey, I'm, we're teaching cars how to see. Why can't we help a person who cannot see, maybe making use of some of the sensors? So this was the general idea. And so I, I stepped into this field that takes the te technical name of assistive technology. It's not, it's not a term used very much. If you, you know, word will sign, will mark the word assistive as non-existing. So maybe it's good if I explain it with the words of a person who used to be a program director at NIH. 
assistive technology are services that provide equipment or systems, standardized or individualized, whose aim is to improve or maintain the functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. And the key word is functional capability. <coughs> Unlike by, by um, rehabilitation engineering, um, we are not trying to fix the impairment. Okay, if I'm designing a uh, retinal prosthetics, I'm trying to help you see again. Uh, and that's a fantastic worthy um, uh, goal. That, that's not what I do. Uh, assistive technology <coughs> accepts the fact that you have lost some physical or mental functionality and helps you get by with that. Helps you live activity of daily living through support from technology. That's what it does, and that's what we are working on. That's a little bit of a smaller goal, if you want to, than this grand goal of building um, uh, prosthetics that can replace uh, parts of your body, cochlear implants, and things like that. Now, we just try to help you get by through the day with your physical or mental impairment. Now, um, the next slide, please take it with a little bit of salt. But this is really very true. So, in entering this field, I enter what I call the vicious loop. And I can tell you many people are with me on this. So, the vicious loop is starts when a person like me, who's an engineer, has done something, and one, one, one morning wakes up and thinks, what about what I just did, this particular algorithm, this particular system, why don't I use it to help the blind? What a fantastic, brilliant idea. And so you start working on that, and you do what people in academia do, you start publishing papers, you try, <laughs> try to get grants, uh, maybe you start even running experiments with human subjects, the press is going to love you. you know, the engineer who does good things for humanity, uh, you're, you're on the front page of everything. And then at some point, when you really try to have the system being used, you discover that people are not really using it, some people even criticize you. So why are you criticizing me? I'm doing something for you, right? Um, and there is frustration or resentment on your end with you, the engineer, saying, why don't they, the people who are supposed to use my fantastic tool, why don't they use it? And on the other end, you see people telling you, OK, here is another one of these guys that comes with a useless gadget. So uh, this is what I call the vicious loop, right? Um, and I can. You know, as you want to mention, I sit on a, on a almost permanent committee that views proposals for the NIH, and I see tons of situations like this. I, I know it pretty well because I'm the first person who has been here. So, a person with some sensible researcher at the end of the loop just pulls a quit and goes back to the things that this person knows how to do well. Then a few desperados like me keep circling the loop um, trying to see whether there is something that we can learn um, and at the end uh, perhaps uh, being able to really build something that people will actually end up using. And so what, what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit of my, the things that I've learned uh, both in positive and in negative towards this goal. Yeah, there's, there's a quote that goes something like, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And the idea of it is that uh, if something is not perfect, people will criticize it even though it's good. Uh, and, that can, and that's bad for good. So presumably, these, whatever you design here is good, but not perfect, so it's criticized. That would be an optimistic view. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I'll show you an example that is more pessimistic, to show one example in which, in fact, uh, even though I thought it was good enough, perhaps even just the problem was wrong. Well, the way I would call it is that we often start with a solution in search of a problem, and that's extremely common. Um, so, uh, the first thing, of course, that the first lesson I learned is that you need to know your customer. I really see these types of applications as a sort of consumer market um, for a very special community that you need to know. Right? And if you ever worked in consumer market, and I have some experience by working with small startup companies, it's very difficult to really understand what is the killer app, what is the killer tool that people will need that will find convenient, that will cost the right amount of money, and et cetera, et cetera. So let's start a little bit with the customer in this case who are people with visual impairment. So a little bit of statistics. Um, 
The first pie here shows you, in the United States, all of the population in gray are people with normal vision. Um, then in this yellow, uh, where is the laser? Here. Here. The laser is not working on the big okay. screen. No problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the yellow cheddar slice there is people, thank you, with uh, good old times, Hi. like that. Um, with uh, significant vision loss. This means people who have some trouble performing something, even wearing glasses. These people can still probably drive a car, etc. But they, they feel that it has some problem with their vision. The much smaller slice is people who are legally blind. That means in the United States that you have acuity less than 20 over 200, or that <coughs> you have tunnel vision less than 20 degrees of field of view in your best corrected eye. Let me ask you a question about significant vision loss. Let's say someone with glasses is fully correctable, so they don't count the significant vision loss even though... No, if you, if you never have problems, if you, if you don't feel that you have problems, but if you feel that sometimes you can't really re read a sign, right. that it would be a person with a problem. Gotcha. Legally blind is, is quantified. It's more of a problem. Mind you, there are some states in the United States in which you can even drive the car e even if you're legally blind. So, uh, it's okay. Don't write that. Um, <laughs> and uh, these are people, it's very, very tiny, it's like about 250 to 300,000 people in the United States who were declared as blind. You will hardly find, it's not so easy to find a person who is completely blind, who has zero light perception. Most blind people you deal with have some light perception, but you can do much with just light perception. You can help you quite a bit in getting some orientation because you know where the window is, right? Uh, but, but there are other things. So it is a very small market, indeed. Um, if you just address, as I have done, um, people with, who are blind. And here's a funny thing. Uh, as engineers, we, we like simple things. We like simple models. So we tend to like the blind. This person sees or does not see. And it's, it's not a good approach, in part because, again, there are very few people who are totally blind. And in part because we tend to associate a person who is blind with basically a robot. And now I'm going to control, you know, I'm going to give you all of the sensory input that you need without realizing a person who is blind has their way to get around, you know, use other sensory perception, mental model, and etc. So if you really want to help a person who's blind, you really need to understand how this person gets by, how this person is able to move in the house, how this person is able to use a computer, etc. Age distribution, uh, just quickly, uh, one third of people with uh, significant vision loss are about 65. I used to call them senior, but I'm getting older. So <laughs> I, I, I don't like the term anymore. <laughs> but uh, this is this important. In part, this is due to the fact that there are progressive diseases like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, um, that hits you when you get older. Um, why is this important? Uh, because if you develop technology, uh, people who are older are less receptive to very new things. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of early adopters in this uh, population. Some more um, statistics. Let me just summarize this one here. Not surprisingly, if you can't see well, it is more difficult to get a good education. Think about learning math, geometry, geography without seeing things. It is a big issue. Um, if you write a formula, you know, you can translate things in Braille. And there exists a type of Braille, Nebeth Braille, that translates formula in Braille. But think about it. Try to really understand the formula if you write it in LaTeX. Okay, you can write a formula in a linear language like ASCII. But to really get it, you need to see it in 2D. Okay, formulas are 2D things. So the whole thing becomes difficult not to talk about geometry. Um, and I mentioned Braille, and we tend to have the notion that if you're blind, you know Braille. It's not so true anymore, unfortunately. This is statistics about, oops, about uh, children uh, of uh, less than 18 years of age, I think, that are legally blind, and only a small portion of these children actually learn Braille. Nowadays, unfortunately, Braille is taught less and less, in part because, of course, you have computers talking to you, so we kind of think that maybe Braille is not needed. A lot of blind people think that that's a real pity, that Braille should be taught. Um, in general, you can't expect that a person who's blind will read Braille, especially if you turn blind when you're older. 
because learning Braille is not easy because your sensitivity to your finger is smaller and if you became blind because you had diabetic retinopathy, diabetes also um, has microneuropathies, uh, microneuropathies, so you really lose a lot of sensitivity. So these are all things that you need to keep in mind. So one exercise that I think you should do is to try to think, okay, you can see well what it is that you cannot do. And these are some of the things. I put them like a Snellen chart here. Uh, in more or less priority order, you cannot drive your car for people who become, um, who lose their sight late in life. Not being able to drive the car tends to be one of the heavy things. Um, and that's why we need to emphasize public transportation. You can't read the paper, you may trip over an obstacle, may miss a sign far away, may not be able to cross the street safely, I have more to say, but they may not find what they're looking for in the supermarket, may get lost in a new place, may not receive a proper education, as I mentioned, and therefore may not be able to find a good job. You may not recognize friends from a distance, which can be a little bit embarrassing at times. You might lose objects in your home, may have problems over the web, might not know who is in the room. Can everybody read this? <laughs> because you may not be able to read this line. Uh, okay, so some other things that you can't do. And as an engineer who wants to build technology to help a person who can see, you probably have to pick a choose here and try to decide um, what, what it is that you want to work on. Now, I see Ben Shaw sitting there. And Ben, I hope you don't mind if I very briefly show this slide. I wanted to show one slide with the IBM logo here. So this is the result of an exercise that Ben's group and I have been doing about trying to build persona, trying to educate ourselves and imagining how a person who can see the different types, there's a huge diversity among the people who can see, what it is that you would be able to do, not to do what we do in your life, and etc. So I don't know if I was allowed to show this, I'm gonna switch over, but <laughs> I wanted to show that. Uh, <laughs> you were allowed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, if I'm not allowed here, where else? Um, and if you like bubble uh, diagrams, this is just another one. We tend to strive for independent living, even though I have to say, in my experience with dealing with people with disabilities, diversity is the keyword. So, in most of the cases, independent living is what we strive for. I know some people who really don't care about independent living. I know people who were born blind, and they are used to people tending to them, and they're expecting that. And if you if you try to push them into living more independently, they might not be too happy about that. So we have to appreciate the whole diversity that there is. Anyways, for those who are care, who care are interested in independent living, I, the, the four bubbles here are some of the main things we need to achieve, I think, and we need to, to be able to do in our life is important. Education, employment, travel, entertainment, socialization. And the, 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 the color bubbles, represents some of the topics in which technology can help towards this goal, which are, and I'll talk about several of these, mobility, wayfinding, computer access, information access. And if you wonder why, what's the difference between information access and computer access, computers are so special in everybody's life nowadays that they really have a particular type of uh, a special place in our life. So accessing computer versus accessing information all around <coughs> us, in my mind, is a little can you explain to me, does that mean you don't need someone else's, some other person's help? Maybe a dog something another person's help? Um, for example, I was talking, speaking with a person who is used to always go to work with uh, being driven by one of those para, um, paratransit systems, rather than taking the bus. This person could have taken the bus, he didn't want to. She wanted, he wanted somebody to come pick <coughs> them up and walk with them. Whereas other people whom I know really don't want to go on paratransit. They really want to push themselves and try to do that by independently. So it's, it's a little bit of an attitude that some people have <coughs> towards. Let me make another example, not related to blindness. I teach a class on disabilities, a large class at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I see disability as a kind of a realistic thing. I had a person, a guest person, who is a neurorehabilitation expert. She's fantastic. She deals with persons with spinal cord injury, stroke, brain, traumatic brain injury, and the like. And she was visiting some remote village in Nepal, trying to um, uh, uh, suggest these people to start using motor wheelchairs. Motor wheelchairs will give independence to be a party And the people there looked at her and said, look, if somebody here is paralyzed, the whole village comes to help. The concept of this person will move around by themselves 
it's something that in our society doesn't make sense. We, we really, part of the society is everybody will come and help. So, this concept of independence that, especially of course in Western country, we, we value highly, might not be as important in other societies. That, that's what I meant. Um, okay, so let me start with some success stories, not from my lab. These are things that work. Technology that does help people who are blind. Screen readers, in my opinion, is number one. These are uh, the first ones, by the way, were developed at the IBM by Chieko Sakawa's group in, uh, in, in Tokyo, some of the best and uh, the first readers. This is a system that reads the screen to you and allows you to actually interact with the computer to navigate the web. They are not perfect because web pages are complex, but if you think about the difference in quality of life between not being able to read a paper, access information except from the radio and the TV, and being able to interact with a computer is a tremendous change. Screen magnifiers are used by people who have low vision. Braille, interfa Braille interfaces are very handy for those who can read Braille. They're a lot, little bit expensive, but a lot of people use them. A larger and telescope, again, to read a paper, or this is a system developed at Arizona State that um, has a camera here that zooms in onto the blackboard where the teacher is writing something. This allows students with low vision to follow a class. Um, accessible GPS, we use GPS a lot, I'll have more to say about that, as well as optical color recognition, other tools like money reader, even object recognition and crowdsourcing. So these are some of the success stories that I wanted to do. How does your Braille thing work? I mean, is it's an interface to a computer? And this interface to a computer, Braille? it creates one line of text, <clears throat> and you fill it with your fingers. When you're done, you press and you get to the next line. So. Again, this is very handy in social situations where you don't want the computer to really read aloud in front of other people and you want to carry it from. And for people who are proficient, they love it. Uh, extremely expensive, unfortunately, because this is a mechanical system. A little thing like that is probably $1,500, and it's just one line of refreshable braille. People are working on big matrices, and they cost a fortune right now. So this is a this is a place where you know I'm, I'm expecting a big breakthrough in technology, building a big refreshable uh, matrix in Braille that is affordable. So let me start telling you a little bit the things that we've been working on. Let's start with mobility. These terms, mobility and orientation, are technical terms used by orientation <coughs> and mobility instructors, who are professionals who help people who are blind to learn to get around. <coughs> mobility. Uh, this is a definition by my friend Richard Long in Michigan, moving safely, gratefully, and comfortably through the environment. It depends on large part on perceiving the properties of the immediate surroundings. So moving safely, gracefully, and comfortably. If you are familiar with robotics, I would say that the equivalent of mobility is obstacle detection, whereas orientation is what in robotics is called path planning. So mobility means being able to walk without bumping into obstacles and trying to walk in a straight line. So the first thing we need to see, okay, what, how do people who are blind walk? Those who walk independently. Some blind people simply never walk independently. 10% of people become blind, they never leave the house by themselves. <coughs> Those who do, well, they use the cane, right? Or a dog. White cane is... Um, used by about a half of blind people in the United States. Dogs have much fewer users, which is always surprising to me. Also because I know a lot of blind people who have dogs and love to walk with dogs. So if you ever see a blind person with a dog, they likely walk faster than you do. These dogs tend to walk fast and straight, and they feel secure with a the dog. They know they're not gonna bump into us. All right, so, but you know, there are disadvantages all of these. They have really low tech, so how about some more high tech? Has somebody thought about that? Sure. A lot of tools have been proposed, very few people if any ever use them. And uh, undeterred by this information, I thought, why? We are so good at building sensors for 3D sensors and sort of things for vehicles. Why don't we start by building a tool that helps with mobility? Let me explain very briefly what this tool does. So this was back in 2004 or so. so right now we have range cameras, like Kinect, Kinect 2, or sort of things, and those times, range imaging was a little bit more in infancy. In fact, this system is not a range imaging system. It's a very simple system. The um, ideally would have the size of a flashlight, even though in the 
in our implementation at the size of a hammer or a meat tenderizer if you want to, um, good to hit somebody in the head. But those are built with a laser pointer and a camera in what is called an active triangulation um, setup. Something very simple. By triangulation allows you to precisely measure the direction, sorry, the distance of a surface that is illuminated by your laser pointer. Now, okay, I measure distances, big deal. Could be useful up to some extent. But what we did was something more. We kind of study the dynamic use of the system. If you look at this picture here, my students then build that, uh, you see it. Um, a line of light, the system really was a laser pointer. So this was a picture taken with longer exposure time as then was pivoting the system up and down like that. And why, why would I do that? Well, because if you can measure constantly, real time, the distance to surfaces as you are moving this thing up, look what happens if you're in front of a step. So imagine that this is a person, this is my tool and I'm pivoting it like that in front of a step. Steps are very important. If you walk, you don't want to trip on the step. Well, if you keep, if you measure the range throughout your uh, pivoting up, this is the range measurement you have. You will notice the discontinuity here. This is the discontinuity that you have once the laser pointer hits the, the vertical face. So, as you move the thing up and down, and you track also the, the inclination of this through an accelerometer, and you track the range that you have with your Kalman filter, whatever you want, you will be able to detect discontinuities. You'll be able to tell that at some point there was a step or a step down in front of you. Does it say to you a number? What does it do? Uh, the system would uh, simply beep, um, and it will also give you a sound um, of the, about the distance. Okay, so we, we just spent a ton of time on the user interface on that, in part because we realized something. Okay, this system, we're trying to sell it to people in the idea, look, this is great, it was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, this allows you to detect steps much further away than a cane can do, maybe three, four meters. And when we were going around to people, blind people, they would tell us, how exactly would I use it? Why would I use it? Well, should I use it instead of a cane? not together with a cane, but I only have two hands, what if I have a coffee cup in the other hand? So, we didn't realize that the very low tech, like a cane, can do fantastic things. In fact, a cane can work as a bumper, it can work as a probe to fill up, to fill the size of an opening, um, it can help detecting landmarks, but especially line of direction. People use cane to walk parallel to a wall by hitting the wall with a cane so they know the distance to the wall. It can detect drop-offs, it can be used as a measurement tool, but especially a cane is cheap, it only costs 20 bucks. It never runs out of power, unlike a computer. It's light, durable, and foldable, and I like this one here. It always works. Will my computer vision algorithm always work? Not too sure. Um, identifies a blind traveler and, and a put driver's name. So, this is a big lesson for me. Beating the cane is not something you want to try to do. Um, will you really feel so confident that your system works so perfectly as to tell a blind person, throw away your cane, just use mine? Absolutely not. And then you run into some issues of convenience. Sure, I can see it further away. How important is that? And if to do so, I need to have something that I carry in my hand. I need to learn something to use. I need to change batteries every day. All these convenience, cost, size sort of things are very important considerations that made me understand that nobody would ever use a tool like the one that I, put, that I built. So please don't tell the NSF to pay for this. <laughs> but you know, uh, this was a great lesson for me. And after that, I realized, OK, next time, First, let's get to know more blind people. I became friends with a lot of blind people. I'm kind of known in the local community. These people are very patient with me. And, and, um, and also, let's try to find good problems, which is honestly probably the most difficult part of my job right now, is to understand what are problems that I should attack versus those that I should not. And way too often, I'm driven by the fact that I can do something, therefore I will do it. We shouldn't do things just because we can do them. The other big problem, of course, is what I call the academic drift. 
Now we start doing something and then we go off the tangent because we can start publishing papers and we find some nice little theoretical problem that we can solve and that distracts us from addressing the real problem. Um, oh, by the way, these are tons of things that a dog guy can do, not even compare. Is obstacle detection something they should not care about at all in terms of technology? Maybe not. There has been, for example, an orientation mobility person at the veteran center in Palo Alto who told me, look, if you could build this little system that is very small, you attach it on your jacket lapel, and it just does one thing. It tells you when you're about to hit your head against an aerial obstacle. That could be very useful. So the first thing we did this time, we started with the right step, is Z a problem? Is that really a problem? Do people who are blind hit their head against an open cupboard door? Uh, we ran a, a, a survey with about 200, 300 people who are blind visually or, and legally blind. We found out that 13% um, of these people reported a head level condition at least once a month. So there are a substantial number of people who do happen to hit their head. Is it very serious? Well, sometimes people like to have surgery, sometimes we'll just hit their head. But it certainly is upsetting, okay? Uh, if you ever try to walk blindfolded, you're scared. That's the, the, the feeling to describe that. You don't know what can happen to you, and you're really afraid to hit your head against something. So we did start with a student um, to design a system. It was based on ultrasound bilateration. I'm not going to spend much time on that. These are the specifications of the system that would have to have a certain field of view, horizontal or vertical, enough to make sure that it warns you in time before you hit your head. We kind of dropped it, in part because my student found a good job in a startup. That's always a problem to, to keep good students in, uh, in a booming economy. Uh, in part because I am not convinced. I'm not convinced that people would actually use it, because if you hit your head once in a are you really going to bring every single day a tool that will have false alarms? Sometimes it will stop when there was nothing. Uh, you'll have to change the buttons. You have to remember to put it on every day. Eh, people are not going to do it. If you walk in an area that you're not familiar with, perhaps you're going to keep your hand like that. Uh, one of my instructors recommend sometimes to wear hats with a large brim so that the brim hits the obstacle before you. So this is probably also a, a, a false move. Um, let me talk about then some other types of products we work on. The general concept of wayfinding, which is very interesting, also think of an intellectual point of view. So, wayfinding again, a definition, but it's along is the process of navigating through the environment and traveling to places by a relatively, relatively direct path. As I said, path planning. Is that important? Well, I, I like the, the words of all I heard. This guy is the guy who, one of the first guys who designed wayfinding signs that you see the airport. He actually designed, it was kind of a groundbreaking at the time, in 1972 in the Munich Olympics, he started putting these ideograms of um, representing uh, activities, sport activities, and etc. He also designed the logo of Lufthansa. So um, finding a way is not a gift or an innate ability. It's a precondition for life itself, knowing where I am. My location is the precondition for knowing where I have to go, wherever it might be. And if I need to go places, I need to know where I am and how to get there. So, um, and I also, I had to show this one here. I was in Japan um, last year for a couple of weeks for a sabbatical, actually visiting the IBM lab. and. Um, and I happened to visit the Kiyomizu temple in Kyoto. It's a fantastic temple. And at some point, I noticed a little square, a little square with a lap stone. Um, there are two stones separated by something like 10 meters. And here is the sign that says, the stone is called La Fortune Telling Stone. If you walk safely from this stone to the other with your eyes closed, for once your wish will be granted soon. If you can't, it will be long before your love is realized. And it is said that taking advice requires you to have someone who will help you achieve your love. This is a little bit of a strange English. But basically, the concept is um, you need to start from a stone, close your eyes, and try to walk straight to the other stone. Let's see if you can reach it. If you touch it, then your love life is going to be successful. It's a real way finding scenario, right? By the way, if you are blind, walking in a straight line is extremely difficult. There are tons of experiments that show that without sight, the reference, you will almost certainly start veering away. The other thing that's interesting is that 
uh, you can have some help. In fact, there were a lot of kids there playing with this. It was a lot of fun to see them. So somebody would start like the, 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 this young person here with their eyes closed, and their friends would tell you, left, right, left, right. And if through the help of your friend, you will uh, um, reach the stone, this friend has a responsibility in your love relationship. I don't know exactly what it is. So there is, you know, they, they thought about this probably, I don't know, 100 years ago, and uh, they also thought about the concept that yes, assistive technology, or assistive something can be used. Anyway, so the first thing I think that we should think about is how people who can see uh, find their way. Well, I would say there are three main parts here. One is prior information, a map. Okay? Um, we often consult maps to go to places, or we hear verbal direction. Uh, the office is two doors down and then make a right. Once we are in the place, indoor or outdoors, where we are trying to find a way, path integration is the um, functionality by which we continuously update in our mind our own position. So here it says continuous update of egocentric coordinates of starting location. But in truth, we are forming an allocentric representation of the environment where we are. Think of a bird idea. So some of us are able to do that. Some, like me, are totally not able to do that. But if you can do this, it means that as you walk somewhere, somehow in your brain, you are remembering to turn left and right, and you have an organic completion of a cognitive map. Some of us can tell from here where the exit door of the building is. I don't even try. Some of us always know where north is. Some of us know, once they go somewhere, how to go back. If you can do that, in, usually it's because you formed a cognitive map in your mind. And to do that, you have to remember that you turn right and left. You have to pay attention to these things. So this is called path integration, which is the equivalent, if you want, to dead reckoning navigation in robotics or in, in, in um, aerospace engineer. Uh, the other possibility is piloting. Piloting means referring to the landmarks that are visible, that are sense, that you can access with your sense. So seeing a sign, seeing that there is a corridor there, so you need to take the corridor, um, noticing landmarks and the like. So piloting is more of an egocentric type of representation. Here I am, I see something there, I go there. I don't need to integrate this into a global view of what is happening. How do people who can't see find their way? Really, in a kind of similar ways. Uh, some prior information. Uh, maps, if you use a map, they need to be tactile. Uh, unfortunately, tactile maps are not used very much. I think tactile maps are great. They are not very convenient because made it, they are made in paper. They are difficult, but I'll be more to say about that. Verbal direction, absolutely. And there are all studies about how blind people communicate direction to places differently than sighted people. So how does a tactile map work? What is it? So a uh, tactile map is uh, a typical one. It's made with paper. I have an embossed in my laboratory. So embossed a piece of paper with lines, raised lines, raised areas, different uh, textures. So you have a more or less of a binary representation of a map. But the problem being that the, 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 there are two problems. One is that your tactile resolution is, is, is low. Okay, so the dots need to be half a millimeter wide. So you can't really put a lot of information in it. And that's why, in my opinion, and there's something I plan to work in the future, you have to think about non-metric mappings. You have to think about maps that maintain the topological information of what you want to show, but not necessarily metric information. If you have a large empty space, there's no point in of using all your map for that. If you look at maps of um, public transportation, for example, very often they're not metric. They're topological, but not metric. There's no point in taking a whole space for a long stretch. So I think that that tactile map should be used in this way. The other problem with tactile maps is that you don't have a whole view of the map. Uh, with sight, you see the whole thing at once. You notice special relationships immediately. If you explore a map with your finger, you have to build the special relationships. It's like looking at a picture through a pinhole that you move around. Much more difficult to build that whole concept and the spatial relationships. So path integration, I think that if you're blind, you need to learn some type of path integration. But I know blind people who simply don't. They get less lost immediately. Um, some blind people learn very carefully to count their steps, to count their turns. 
and they know exactly how many steps they will go before they turn right and then left to go to the office. Piloting, which is sensing, sure, as a blind person you also sense, but of course you can't see things. Um, you could read braille sign, if you can read braille, you may notice some landmarks that are mostly acoustic of that type. Now here is the main thing. Except for acoustic landmarks, that are not too common. But here I could hear, for example, the coffee machine going. So I may figure out that maybe, maybe it's not a coffee machine. Either. Um, but in general, the perceptual sphere of a blind person is limited to one arm's length. The, what what, what psychophysicists call the uh, distal stimuli basically don't exist with blind people. Uh, as a sighted person, I can see things 20 meters away, and I can get my orientation. As a blind person, this is my work. I can get lost in uh, anywhere. I had blind participants in my studies getting lost in the bathroom and not being able to come out of the bathroom because they were not able to find a door. So there is something we need to really realize how limited the, 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 the um, perceptual sphere of a blind person is. So, um, and one of well, the main solution of great findings, I think, is probably GPS in general. And many people think that through GPS we solve kind of a problem. It's not a problem. It's not true. In part because the GPS only works outdoors, but also because of the resolution, which is limited up to 10 meters. And here is again, this is connected to what I just said about the, the, the perceptual sphere. Look, I took a picture of my building here, but just a little bit over 10 meters away. So that's what the resolution of GPS that we use. GPS would have taken me to the building. Okay, here I am. Now find the door. Blind person, you probably spend easily 20 minutes walking around until you find this door, and bumping into things here and there. You would use your cane to move around, and you would uh, probably try to see if there is anybody can help. If not, you would start doing what is called a perimeter search. You're taught that the orientation mobility. Usually, you're taught to do that in an indoor space. So, if a blind employee came here, probably an orientation mobility person would start walking around this blind person around the perimeter of this room. Why the perimeter? Because you don't want to be in an open space as a blind person. In an open space, you're completely lost. So if you sit here in the middle of this room, you're totally lost. You don't know where to go. If you are next to the surface, you can follow the surface. You can feel the landmarks, start remembering landmarks and things like that. In this situation, if I had been here before, not sure. You would you know, go and bump into things, and it would be extremely difficult to find it. So this, I call it the last meter. This is really difficult. So. Uh, there is something that we need to absolutely keep in mind when designing web funding system. Now, infrastructure can help a lot. And there is infrastructure that supports wayfinding. Simple thing is these tactile paving tiles that probably I've noticed in several cities. Now, you don't see these very long tiles very often. I see them in, in Japan a lot, even though I, I hardly will see a blind person around. Um, Accessible pedestrian signals, these are the little beepers that you notice in some uh, um, traffic intersections, and they help you both understanding when is your time to cross, but also they give an indication of the direction of the landmark at the other end of the crosswalk. Then there have been technology that dated from the 70s that worked really well, but I think it's dead. Uh, so talking sign by the Smith Catherwell Eye Research Institute, the technology they used infrared beacons, a multi-rated light. As a blind person, you will hold a receiver in your hand, and if you point it in the right direction and you are within 10 meters or so from this beacon, the, the system will demodulate the light and talk to you, basically. So this is really old analog technology with a lot of potential. Why am I saying is that? Because it costs a lot of money to place that. That's the problem with infrastructure. Somebody has to pay for that. Um, and, uh, and how can you get people to pay for that? Basically, the only way is to make it into regulation, to make it as mandatory by the American with Disability Act. The fact that every room here has a braille sign and maybe a relief letters is because the ADA mandates that. So there's a lot of politics that goes in here. Uh, for example, this company here has been lobbying quite a lot to try to have their system be mandated, but they have not been successful, which means that companies are not going to pay for that. It costs too much money to support it. Other proposed systems are RFIDs embedded in, in uh, for example, here in the soil, under the floor, uh, with an RFID reader on your cane. 
This is a more recent one. It uses um, low power Bluetooth iBeacons. Maybe some of you are familiar with those. Apple has been pushing quite a bit this iBeacons technology. In SFO, in Terminal 2, there is an installation of about 300 iBeacons. The iBeacons are tiny little things that send Bluetooth signal. They only send their ID, not much more than that. They are battery operated, they can last for two years. They're very tiny. You attach them, they're cheap. You, 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 you put them all around, then you train a system to convert information from which IDs I'm receiving to more or less where I am, and that gives you a location that you can access through your iPhone, say, within the terminal. I've been testing that recently, and it doesn't work great, but it's, it's, it's kind of good. And again, this requires some infrastructure. It requires willingness of an agency to work on that. Is there a yeah, question? Just, if we could, uh, or we could probably talk about it later, the, the cons of like the iBeacons, about like some, some of the things that you've noticed. Because I'm working with them now. And so the, the cons of iBeacons, um, I think that iBeacons work well if, if you're in a smaller space, like in a corridor, mm -hmm. and if you have a good density. What happens, I think, in Terminal 2 is that, like any terminal in an airport, you have a huge space. Mm -hmm. And so I tested quite a bit, and um, if you're in the middle of a large space, you receive some information with very low power few, uh, because this is always integrated with inertial information from your phone, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, as you move, as you rotate it, you, you do some sensor fusion. So if you are close to a place with a two or three iBeacons, the precision was pretty good. Otherwise, it start drifting a little bit. So all in all, I think I would like to run a user study mm -hmm. on the terminal. I talked with the company, Indoor.rs, oh. and as soon as I have some time, I would like to try that. See whether the, the, the accuracy the gives is good enough to do anything good. Um, this system, though, it needs a map. Most of the system here, um, like this iBeacon thing. You, in fact, need to train to do what is called a word driving so that you kind of <coughs> understand if I'm sitting in a certain spot and I receive, and as you can see, three ID beacons, this is my area. What if you don't have a map? That is something that always intrigued me. Google is saying that it's going to map everything, and I can believe it to some extent, but I don't think that every single building has been mapped or will ever always be mapped. So one of the projects that we're working with some little support from Citrix um, was a system that helps to do uh, safe backtrack. So imagine this situation. You're blind, you enter a building, you go to the doctor, and the receptionist walk you to the doctor's office through three corridors. Um, and then you're done with the doctor, and you leave the doctor's office, and there is nobody there to take you, and you the one to go and disturb people, and you would like to walk back. You, you kind of think you remember how to walk back, and then you get lost. Happens all the time. You get lost, and the moment you get lost as a line person, you're really lost because you don't have any more references, you don't have any more landmarks. So what we've been playing with and building is a system that does just one thing. It knows nothing about prior information on the map of the place, but it tracks you as you move around. It does the path integration for you, if you will. And then if you need to go back, it helps you go back. The system detects the turns that you took, counts the step between turns, and also looks the signatures from the Wi-Fi access points that are in there. Just to give you an idea, um, this is, um, Simone, when is my uh, stop time here? I want to make sure that I don't. Um, it's in seven minutes. Um, you, you know, we allow for uh, some room afterwards. Very good. So you know what, so I, I can talk about this a little bit. I, I think I overshot it. Uh, a little bit later. Um, and I'm going to just mention this and then a couple of things more. So, actually, no. Skip this one here. Let's just jump into, into this one. So the problem with indoor navigation system, there's a lot of interest in indoor navigation. Uh, companies like Google Indoors, Navizone Indoors, are building systems that work like your GPS for the car. They have a turn-by-turn -turn direction uh, uh, type of thing. And these systems, I think, have a big problem because, again, you need some spatial context to be able to do something like that. You need to have more of a scene knowledge, not just know that you need to turn left, because that won't help you then to find a door. Imagine, for example, a situation in which you need to go to a meeting in a certain meeting room. You're blind, somebody taught you exactly how to go there, or a system helps you to take the elevator to get to this room. And you enter the room, you made it. You're a little bit early because you wanted to be early. And you lost. 
Pati Cerero. They're going to be a big table with chairs around. There's going to be several chairs like in this layout. Is there a water fountain? Where is the projection? Low level scene description is necessary to give context to do things. And unfortunately, set the people don't need it. A turn by turn guidance system is perfect set of people because then you can access the context. As a blind person, this doesn't work. So this is where I think um, computer vision has good potential because it can give you some context in there. So these are some examples for it, oops, of system built by colleague of mine who works on detecting uh, crosswalks to help a person understand where you cross. This is a work for students of mine who use an iPhone to do three-dimensional destruction of situation like this. Um, and also we've been working a lot on text spotting, which is the ability of very quickly detecting text in a scene that you can use as a reference. So it can tell you, hey, there is something here to read. Get closer and use OCR to read that. There's also tremendous potential for crowdsourcing. Um, Be My Eyes, for example, is an organization that has been used by a lot of people, about 100,000 uh, times that has been used by blind people to get help. And it's very simple. You can sign up as a volunteer. If so, if a blind person needs you, they go to this app. And this app basically starts FaceTime, Skype for, for, for uh, iPhone. And this blind person will get in touch with you, receive a, a, a request for help. This blind person can show you what the camera is seeing. Help me out. I need to find this object. What type of medicine is this? What is on my plate? Where is the exit? And at the side of the person, you have this video related to you, and you can send them information. It's been pretty successful. A company, Ida, that I work with is building something similar. They just completed, actually, an experiment with 57 people, in which, however, you blind person would wear Google Glass, they have a camera, and you would have trained agents who would receive. So this is a blind person walking. This is what the agent on their dashboard see and you would give different types of information, given a lot of ancillary information that you have from the sense on the phone of this person. This is very exciting. And the crowdsourcing, uh, is the person who gives the information get paid by the person? So, in the Be My Yes, no, it's all volunteers. With, uh, with Ira, they are thinking about economical models. They want to build a company, so they are trying to see whether it's going to be a uh, per fee, monthly fee. They want to see whether people are going to pay for that the company would pay for that for their blind employees. The economic sustainability of these things, or in general of assistive technology, is always question, but they're trying. So let me jump very briefly into the issue of scanners, because we have been played with those kind of things. I just want to highlight a couple of things in the five minutes that I have left. Using a camera as a blind person is a problem, because you can't see, that you find that you can't see the screen of your iPhone. Try to take a picture without looking at the, the screen, and it's difficult to take a good one. It is a chicken and egg problem. Anything, if we take a good picture of something, the system will be, tell you something good, but if you can't take the picture of exactly what you want, that is difficult. So we have been studying quite a bit how we can assist people use cameras blind person. And I have this big bubble thing here that basically says, look, it is complex. If you use a camera, there is action. You have to decide where to point it. There is a system itself, which has different characteristics of focal length, field of view, computation. With a large field of view, you can see more things. You don't really have to correctly point at something, but then your angular resolution is smaller. You can't see things far away. You need to get closer to those. And interface is the key of everything, because if I can see through the screen, the system needs to talk to me to help me take better pictures. Um, as an example, we studied this to help a person who is blind go to a particular location where there is a visual landmark. We, we created this landmark just to, to make a wizard of all sort of uh, technology in which we pretend that, say, this will be a bathroom science you need to reach, but to make a life easy, we created this color landmark that are easy to identify with cameras. And we studied how, studied how people are able to follow information on the camera that sees the thing from far away to reach it. So I do have one quick movie that I'd like to show, just to give you an idea. Oops. I think, oh, right, I need to use this here, right? Let's 
Yes. I haven't learned exactly how to do it. Try again. There we go. If I okay, how control. Control. Let's right. do control and half again. And then next one. Perfect. Let's see if this works. So you hear a person, thank you very much, who is using the phone to try to find one of these targets. The phone will beep once it starts seeing that. Oh, this, the audio is not on. Now, we, we missed quite a bit of that because we didn't hear when the camera was speaking. But what I wanted to point out here is that it's a difficult thing. You have to first search, oh, then you may yeah, find yeah. something. You need to follow your arm through your proprioceptive capability of doing that. But typically, proprioception is not very good if you don't have your sight. And at some point, you lose the, 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 the target. Your camera is a limited field of view. You have to research that. So, can you go back to your text? So, there's a lot of um, activities that go into something that we think should be super easy, right? You just follow the camera. No, there is a search. Part, there is a guidance part that, of course, once the system has you something, it starts beeping and directs you. How did the camera know what to beep at? Well, in this case, we designed it to, de to detect a particular landmark. Mm -hmm. So, in a real world, you would remember we studied, for example, text spotting in the wild. So, if the system sees a sign and needs to read it, OCR wants good resolution. So you will be guided towards taking a better picture, getting close to this object, and, and, and take a picture of that. My last example is about reading text and OCR. Um, I think you are familiar with optical character recognition, which works pretty well when you have a good picture of what you're doing. And there are apps that do mobile OCR. Um, here is a couple of examples. They really work well, but you really have to take a good picture. Some of these um, accessible apps uh, do what I call the opportunistic discovery. They help you with that. Um, it's very similar to, I don't know if you have a deposit that checks with Bank of America and other things, where there's an app on your iPhone where you have to put it over the, the check and at some point it snaps a picture for you. And it also gives you some big indications. My wife always gets mad when she tries to use that because you know, it works really well. These systems try to identify. So what they do? They, they, they process images real fast. They're trying to understand when is a good time to take a good snapshot? How? For example, because they see the four edges of your document, and they say, okay, all the documents in your picture, or because they do some text spotting, they figure out, oh, there is some text here, okay, this is time to take a snapshot. Um, but they don't work so well for blind people. Um, everybody I talked to has been fairly frustrated with the system, so we designed a system that can do some, uh, some um, guide here. It gives you directions. How does it do it? Well, the idea is very simple. Um, here is one of our tests, and I'm not going to show the video because it's really late, but we ask people, okay, try to move the camera to a point where you can take a good picture and then OCR will read for you. Our system has some guidance that would look at the text, try to figure out whether the whole text in the page is imaged, how, do it, how does it do it? It looks for text using text spotting algorithms, and it figures if there is enough white margin. If not, it gives direction raise, lower, move to the left, move to the right. Um, so this, you can see, is a smarter interface that can help you point the phone, get you better features. So it's a whole interaction that we have. Um, and what we found out, you know, these experiments take a ton of time. As an engineer, I've never been taught how to run human real experiments. And it's something that I am learning. Uh, it's fascinating. You learn a lot. You spend a ton of time. We had, in this case, nine different participants. We actually designed it. the protocol experiments. What we learned is that, not surprised, without any sort of assistance, using mobile OCR is almost impossible, very difficult. And Having some sort of guidance does make the whole process more efficient than these other more simple opportunistic discovery types of modalities. Um, but the interesting things, thing is that our system can also be used to train a person to do it better. So we had person try to take a good picture, a document, without any assistance from the system. Then, with the system guiding them, then let's try again without a system. 
and the third time around, they were so much better. So the system held the training, and training is tremendously important, right? Because you can learn a lot of things. You can learn how to take a good picture to get the patient to try multiple times with somebody telling us, okay, this is a good location. The system, in this case, has the promise to be good for training. I think I went over time, so I wanted to thank you, thank my sponsor, which is the National Institute of Health, and also um, I wanted to mention that if any of you is interested in this type of subject, is interested in collaborating, especially for what concerns intelligent infrastructures that can help blind people, people with disability in general, get um, do the activity of daily life better, please talk to me, I would love to hear. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? No more questions? Uh, yes, one question. One, uh, one, uh, at the end, you uh, talked more about mobile phones. Is there any particular type of uh, smartphones for blind people? Because as you don't have balance, you don't even know if you have an alert in there that's blocking your device. It's, but I think. There's not much market for that. So, so when the iPhone came out, I immediately thought, okay, this is definitely not accessible. Like you can't feel the, the, the key. Why people love the iPhone? Uh, mostly people. And, and in fact, they still use much more iPhones than Android. So it's a surprise to me. And this is due to two reasons. One is that um, iPhone, uh, Apple has been really smart, and for the second version of the iPhone, they introduced VoiceOver, which is, an, is a screen reader for, uh, for a Mac, but it works on the iPhone. And if you guys have an iPhone, if you want to spend five, time, five minutes, go to System Setting, Universal Access, VoiceOver on. It's a little bit frustrating because then you don't know how to go back on anymore. But the great thing is that as you explore the screen with your finger, this reads the icon for you. Uh, you can even input text, that takes a long time without the receiving. So, the iPhone is actually more accessible than we may think. It is not perfect by any means, but people are willing to go the extra mile. Why? Because if I use the iPhone, it's exactly the same system that you as a sighted person are using. And I can use Facebook and use email with the same tool that you're using. The level ground is even now. So this psychological is tremendously important. People love it. So I don't know, I haven't heard of anybody trying to now build, there are, there are in case, you know, there are some um, type of smartphone, regular phone built for elder people who are not very good at, at, at uh, using all these bells and whistles. And you could think maybe they could help also blind person because they're big. Big, um, key, but I don't know any single blind person who can have that. They all want to use the iPhone. Thanks. I have a question. So, is, it, is there a preference of blind people uh, towards cell phones now, smartphones over computers? So, now I'm thinking, for instance, about web pages, right? So, mobile web pages are much easier to navigate because they're essentially mostly text. Okay, good point. Um, I don't think I know the answer to your question. I would, I don't know that navigating, navigating a web page in general is difficult for blind person. Especially with these super cool web pages right nowadays, there's a lot of you know, interactive and content. So, um, I haven't thought about the fact that the effort of making the web page accessible on a cell phone forces the developer to get rid of a lot of this graphical interface and whether that makes it easier for a blind person. Honestly, I haven't thought about that. It's a good question. I, I would ask around. And there are um, the e-book readers like uh, Kindle that will mm -hmm. textify a, a whole web page for you, removing all the images or making them just yeah. static instead of dynamic. So the, the textify web page is, is part of the screen reader. So um, your, if you have a Mac, VoiceOver will do it for you. Mm -hmm. It is always difficult to textify web pages. Why? In part because uh, Many web pages are image driven, so if you don't give a description of the image, you don't do anything with the image, and sometimes if you don't see the image, you can't read it too much. In part because of the whole layout of web pages, very complex, like a table. So there is a lot of studies about how to read web pages, how to make web pages that are accessible, actually. So uh, in that sense, I would say 
that is not just for the e-readers that is technologically being developed in general for all uh, um, for computers. The standard is for PCs is something called JAWS, which is made by, by um, uh, um, I don't remember the name of the company, but it does all of this work. And it, in general, the whole activity of screen reader is a complicated software engineering activity. Because if you, for those of you who understand the things, you need to access what the screen displays. How do you access that? Well, now operating systems have what is called an accessibility API that supposedly goes and grabs all of the user interface elements and provides a handle for you to access those. But even so, it is not very easy because the whole interaction, I don't know, if I click on something, something else happens on another window. How am I going to read that thing to you? So uh, all of this, this interaction makes it difficult to, to, to navigate. I heard a tech talk before about mapping color to the sound. The speaker is color branded. I couldn't appreciate the beauty of the colorful world. So it had the idea of mapping those colors to different sound. So uh, when you saw painting a picture, it will directly um, it abstract be, that yeah. picture to, to a mix of sound. OK, so this, is so this is, it enters the whole realm of sensory substitution. Um, where we basically trying to use other sensory, other sensors to supply, and all that I described in a sense is sensory substitution, but I, I do it at a highly semantic level. That is, I am telling you, I have system talk to me most of the time. It depends on whom you ask how the things work. Okay, uh, people that try those sort of things, they started with Bakirita back in the 70s, who had a system with a camera, we're talking a lot of things, right? And an array of electrodes on your back, and the system would translate a black and white picture into stimulations of the electrons on your back. And it showed that people were able to kind of make, up, make up some, some shapes. So it has to do with the plasticity of your brain in which, you know, there are all these theories about, okay, inside my brain, the visual information is something separate them from the tactile information, or is there a common intermediate challenge, et cetera, et cetera. What I would say is that, so far, the system have shown that in some particular cases, and you get the typical case study where you're in a room, there is a, 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 a black uh, obstacle, and you show that people are able to avoid the black obstacle because they have information on their back, on their tongue, on their forehead, because they hear it, like in the colors, etc. Would they work if I take a picture of this room? The picture is so complex. The things that are in here are tremendously complex. Can I really? make out what is in the picture, make it into a useful representation. I honestly doubt that. So my, I'm a little bit negative on these uh, low-level sensory substitution systems. I'd rather have the picture tell me semantically what is in there. I think it would make more sense. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> my question is on uh, the commercialization and monetizing. Like if you, uh, there, I think there are few researchers, engineers who just really care about like the quality of life, you know, improving one's quality of life. And I personally don't think that we, we really, assistive technology won't receive the reception that it's supposed to until there's some motivation, right, for a developer or for a group to go after it. So I was wondering, have you seen any models that have worked to commercialize or uh, monetize like assistive tech? Or from your experience, um, what could, like a, a possible solution like hypothesis? Like this is a great question. Mm -hmm. The sustainability, market sustainability of assistive technology yeah. is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. So there are very few companies that have been able to make money means to survive, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't do this. Maybe you can do Be My Eyes. It's very successful right now. You're always reliable on tiers. Mm -hmm. um, the quality of assistance you get is not really clear. But right now, it is a good example of something that is somehow self-sustained. Will that last okay. beside it? In terms of company, look, there is Freedom Scientific, I can't remember the name, sells some of these screen readers. Yeah, and this company is making money. It has a monopoly. It really elbows out anybody else who tries to enter the field. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it is really tough, in part because there are few people who are blind. So if you address low vision people, there are many more. Some of these are retirees who might have made a lot of money in life and they lost their sight later. Mm -hmm. So there's a company from Israel called Orcam who has now full hardware 
system with a camera here, that has OCR, there's a beautiful user interface. It is for low vision people, not for blind people. It costs $3,500. It's very expensive. Yeah. They might have a chance because the market is larger than just for blind people and again, where the retail is professionals. But if you look at blind people, these people don't have money. They live off disability. Um, there are very few. Many of them have other problems. So how do you build a sustainable market? It's complicated. So there are different models, right? One is, well, um, let's have um, Windows, uh, Microsoft, um, in the times when IBM was doing computers, IBM, etc. Extend the operating system to have an accessibility layer. The cost is going to be relatively small. It's going to look good for a company. So this model works so and so because it's still, if you have software, it's supported. If you don't support it, it doesn't work. Mm. So I don't think anybody has a solution. I, because I'm collaborating with this IRA company that does, that has agents who can send advice through data uh, relayed from Google Glasses, and this company has been started by people, by a person actually who is a serial entrepreneur who has lost a part of his sight. So this person knows what he's talking about. I'm really curious to see how they're going to pull it off into a sustainable market. For me, it's going to be a, a very, very interesting experience. But you really hit the right spot because it is a, one of the biggest issues. Thank you. Do we have more questions? No? Let's thank Roberto again. This is beautiful. This is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been an honor. So I'd like to join you for lunch. So we yes. Have, we have I don't know. I, 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 I can't because I have a committee uh, meeting in two. And it's the first one of the year and I can't do it. And I'm not teaching it for. No, no. Apologies. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for your first day. Sorry. It was my turn. Oh, okay. No problem. I Doing much, but what are you doing today? So, uh, oh, okay. It is, however, it could be also a damnation because it's okay. absolutely never learned. Mm. The 